Hello, everybody. Um, uh, welcome to the Humanity Centre. This is the uh, the third uh, session in our series on the frozen realms. The um, is itself the fourth part of our natural landscape and natural landscapes and human meaning series. Um, uh, as you know, those of you who attend here uh, frequently, our Tuesday sessions generally take the form of uh, two to three person panels on this subject, and then we pepper this, or festoon might be a nicer word, uh, with the occasional lecture by a celebrated guest. And we were, we we're lucky enough to have that happening today. And to introduce uh, today's special guest and speaker, um, I'd like to invite up to <laughs> the lectern and the podium um, the Associate Professor of Art History at USD and the element chair for the Humanity Center Gallery, Dr. Derek Cartwright. Thanks, Brian, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, many thanks as always to Lindy Via and Maggie McRae for their great teamwork in organizing uh, this Illum lecture and really all the other programs that happen here in the Humanities Center. Uh, as many of you know already from being here at other sessions, we're off to a great start this semester. And with that in mind, it's a real privilege for me to introduce this afternoon's speaker. Christopher P. Hoyer received his bachelor's degree in art history from Bowdoin College and both his MA and PhD degrees from UC Berkeley, as well as a second master's degree from USC. Across a distinguished teaching career that spans 20 years, he has taught at Williams College, Princeton University, Columbia, and the University of Washington, always in the field of European art since 1400. Today, Hoyer is Professor of Art History and Architecture at the University of Rochester, where he also shares an appointment in the Environmental Humanities Program. He's the recipient of actually too many academic honors to mention here, but I'll just say about a few of them, including the Fulbright and Crest pre-doctoral fellowships, multiple postdoctoral fellowships from the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, uh, CASVA at the National Gallery, and the Getty Research Institute, and the Deutsche Akademische Austausch Dienst uh, in Berlin. Uh, an undeniably prolific scholar, Hoyer publishes his research in, I think, the widest array I've ever seen of prestigious academic journals, including October, The Gray Room, Oxford Art Journal, Terra Foundation Essays, as well as more popular venues like Art Forum, Burlington Magazine, and Latham's Quarterly, and as he states self-deprecatingly in his bio, for some reason, also the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> he's, the inter he's the international editorial advisor to the British journal Art History, uh, and among his book-length studies that bear his name, Hoyer is the co-editor with Rebecca Zorak of Ecologies, Agents and Terrains, published by the Clark Studies in Visual Arts in 2018. Also, Andrea Butner, Liber Vagatorum, I think Vagoratum, uh, Der Bettler Orden, which translates into English as the Book of the Vagabonds, the Mendicant Order, which was published in 2020 by Walter Kuhnig in Kuhn and The City Rehearsed, Object, Architecture, and Print in the Worlds of Hans Redemann de Vries uh, by Rutledge in 2009. Connecting to this semester's theme, it's worth highlighting Hoyer's contributions to recent scholarship on frozen places. Specifically, he's the author, and I want to encourage all of you to uh, look at this book and pick it up if you care to, Into the White, the Renaissance Arctic and the End of the Image, which has to be one of the best book titles I've heard in a long time, which was published by Zone Books and Princeton University Press. Into the White was noted as one of the top five books of Northern European art when it first appeared in 2019. But today, his presentation draws from a still more recent project, a forthcoming book that is entitled Early Modern Subterraneans, Episode Attrition Text which promises to take us to some chill territory. I think I'm the first one to make that joke in this <laughs> series. Um, the title of his talk is Treacherous Realms, the Underground Arctic. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Hoyer to the USC. Thank you, Derek, and thank you all for coming. Can you all hear me? 
Um, you're too kind about both the depth of my scholarship and my, um, you know, my contributions to, the, to, a, to a world which I'm still actually kind of learning more about every day. But I'm thrilled to be here. I want to thank the Humanities Center so much for their hospitality, both physical and material and intellectual. I want to thank, it's just been wonderful to be here. And I wish it could stay longer. <laughs> but it's been a great system. And I think this programming that you have is just, I, uh, Brian's, it's, it's absolutely a brilliant idea. In 1555, the Swedish cleric Olaus Magnus, then exiled in Rome, published an astonishingly 778-chapter juggernaut of a book. Its subject was the cold Arctic. Olaus's Historia de Gentibus Septenarabius, literally account of the people who live under the seven stars, is one of the strangest texts ever published in early modernity and opens my subject today. It was originally written in Latin and subsequently translated into English, German, Italian, French, and Spanish before the end of the 17th century. It was a bit of a bestseller. Olaus here offered a sprawling, illustrated survey of northern customs, wars, legends, and things. Phenomena from reindeer to comets to dried cod to runes. And the book, which was cited posthumously from writers from Milton to Borges, addressed, as he's put it, the cold northern lands in which marvels are hitherto unknown, either to Greeks or to Romans. Since its appearance, the Historia has become a source for countless mythologies of frozen Arctic climate, Moore's visions, and others, from Shakespeare to Holderlin to Game of Thrones. Now, the book was written in desperate professional circumstances. Olaus fled to Rome after the Reformation had taken Palma to Sweden, rendering him jobless. Now, the book, as I'll talk about today, offers an unsystematic defense of images in the face of Protestant critiques. It essays the North were familiar of, with ghosts, magic, and metaphorical undergrounds. And the volume takes a particular interest in the cold subterranean. There are literal physical subsurf places like caves and mines, but the Historia also retains a more figural investment in modes of underground description, ones reliant on concealment, suspicion of things beneath expected conditions of comprehension, dreams, specters, and demons. The North, Elias writes, quote, is incessantly haunted by phantoms and monstrous apparitions. But then again, there is the also sub-visual threat of the cold environment itself. Cold, and particularly ice, offers something broader, I'll argue, about what we imagine when we see early modern landscape to be. The strange 1555 book quietly defamiliarizes what of what we say about art history is assumed about Renaissance art and environment. It thinks the North as something in rather than across the earth, something which can never be fully seen. Now, Olaus Magnus's biography was a peripatetic one. Born Olaf Manson in Lichoping in, in 1490, he seems to have studied at Rostock before 1517. Between 1519 and 1521, he wandered throughout Norway with his older brother, Johannes, as a sort of papal representative. In 1521, Johannes was appointed Archbishop of Uppsala, but he held the seat for a mere two years. Excuse me. Um, when Lutheran friendly forces under Gustav Vasa conquered Stockholm, essentially rendering Scandinavia Protestant. Olaus made his way to Rome, and for the next 15 years, Olaus and Johannes shuttled between Denmark and Sweden, alighting in Gdansk, and at one point visiting Venice and central Italy where he published this map in 1539. The brothers eventually settled in Rome in 1541, having been summoned personally by Pope Paul III. Johannes died in 1544. Olaus was promptly named archbishop in his brother's place in absentia, but he would never visit Sweden again. Now, we know that Olaus attended the first Council of Trent between 1545 and 1549, which, just to remind you, was the papacy's first real attempt to deal with Protestantism. His stay at this was a troubled one. We know from records that he was one of two recipients of a charitable subsidy, 
and indicating that he had arrived impoverished. But it was in Trent that Olaus conceived of a book project which intended to describe, as he writes, the far north, numbed by the constant merciless cold, end quote. Such a book would depict a north not of monsters and darkness, but also of ingenuity and resources, a north worthy of pilgrimage, and ideally in 1555, worthy of reconquest by papal forces. He settled here at the church of St. Brigidida in Rome, which as today has its own printing press and a very, very good library. He began to write. Now the text, as Olaus began, was rendered all the more urgent, as he writes, quote, after the new disturbances in Germany. In the far north, quote, the harshness of the elements and the cruelty of the climate, end quote, were assets rather than hindrances. Now the book was aimed at an educated Mediterranean audience, both curious about the northern world as it was becoming about the Spanish New World, and newly conscious of their land's confessional separation from the Pope. The book essayed, that is, a different kind of exoticism from what they were reading about in a balmy America, but it imagined a land also ripe for potential colonization. Now, as a book, the Historia is fragmented and sprawling. There are 22 separate books that are based loosely on Pliny, and in florid and rambling Latin prose, Olaus cites Plutarch, Albertus Magnus, Saxo, Aristotle, Strabo, and Herodotus, and at one point overtly plagiarizes Thomas More's Utopia, which had been written in 1516. Now, Elias is clearly bitter about his Roman exile, and he's constantly attacking Lutherans. But the more interesting part is that more than 480 woodcuts animate the chapters. These illustrate everything like ice tools, drinking contests, carrying baskets, and even, most interestingly, snowball fights. <laughs> we know only little about these prints, only that they might have been commissioned by Vitoli, Olaus' Italian publisher. The blocks are lost today and were cut for the many, many vernacular translations. Over the course of the book, some repeat themselves, some crib from illustrations, but there were 15 other editions over the course of the 17th century. Notably, some of these woodcuts seem to have nothing at all to do with the text. They hew to a specific model of vignettes and abet rather than simply illuminate Olaus's narratives. They are, that is, self-conscious about their status as pictures and their difficulty to read. Olaus writes once, quote, this image shows how, in an admirable way, different observations are made. Or elsewhere, quote, this picture explains itself, end quote. Now, certain of these woodcuts startle today for their prescient abstraction, as it were. But again, Olaus is describing northern invisibilities like damp, wind, and in this case, magnetism in distinctly non-human terms. Now, the Historia displays a particular fascination with tunnels, caverns, and grottos. These appear as both physical spaces and as well epistemes, ways of knowing. These undergrounds are ambivalent spaces, and unlike those in, say, balmy Italy, are preternaturally haunted by wonders. We learn across these many chapters that, for example, certain Icelanders live in caves with ghosts as protection against the code. That a magician named Gilbert here occupies an underground lair near Nick Latvateren, near a geyser whose sulfurous flames suffocate anyone trying to intrude. That there is a subterranean lake near Trondheim that never freezes, even in the middle of winter. That the Sampi hide underground to escape thunderbolts that the inland sea of Vanner and secrets a quarry used by Roberts to hide loot, and that in ancient times, and here Olaus cites Herodotus, quote, buildings underground appear to have been constructed by Zalamoxus, a man or a demon amongst the Goths, who lived far before Pythagoras, Pythagoras excuse me, shut up there and returning from some years after it elapsed, he might pretend he had gazed upon wonders in the world below. But this world below, for Olaus, is also informative. Olaus frequently relies upon comparativism as a rhetorical move. The Ar Arctic, he writes, is apparently like Greece, for there are prophetic caves by whose fumes men are intoxicated and foretell the future, as if 
the celebrated Oracle of Delphi. And such subterraneans are crucial elements of local legends. Oleus tells how a man from Livonia apparently descended into his cellar to become transformed into a wolf. And further, quote, after the Danish monarch had treacherously murdered his brother Harold, the guardians of the king's nephews, Harold and Halden, wishing to save these innocent boys from a brutal death, kept them in an underground cave disguised as puppies. <laughs> Latin translation, it's so. um, young dogs. But not just myth as a disguise. There is the idea that in the north, to survive, one must bury oneself, that the underworld can both punish and haunt. Concealment here arrives as a strategy of hope. But the literal subterranean that receives its lengthiest treatment in the Historia is one of extraction. Historia's book six is devoted, devoted entirely to mines and metals. And in its preface, the bishop's prize, uh, pride is audible. Quote, as he writes, the mines in northern lands are very numerous, big, varied, and rich. Because huge numbers of them are sited in valleys and mountains, many of the tunnels often follow closely adjacent courses. There are large two being inexhaustible and spacious, and are found in both Upper Sweden and Gotterland, and in the farms of Varmland near the Norwegian borders. They are varied because they yield silver, copper, steel, and the choicest iron. Now here, Olea strays from his humanistically inclined citation strategy. He doesn't look to ancient authors. He looks to, instead to personal experience and local social history. He describes personally descending, quote, 20 ladders into a small salt mine, small salt mine, excuse me. And we know that, in fact, the real life mining exigencies of this moment were quite on his mind. The Stoda Koppenberg Mining Company, which actually still operates today, um, had been granted a contract as early as 1347. This is a copy of their medieval charter. And Oleus is very proud of the riches that were there yielded. Now, metal and salt mines were a common subject of German books during the 16th century, Agricola and Gessner. They wrote about Saxony and Switzerland in books that Olaus would have known. Um, and we know, but also, that uh, Olaus seems to have read Sebastian Munster's 1540 Cosmographia, one of the first European books about America, and copied prints from it for the Historia. But extensive talk about mining about a metaphorics of extraction was relatively new in a cold northern context. As with the Spanish Andes, with silver at the exact same moment, there was a specific tie in Sweden between mining and indigenous knowledge, and of course, labor. We know that many late medieval iron mines in Sweden lay in Sopni, and we know that Olaus actually visited these areas in 1519. Both Swedish and Spanish undergrounds effectively rendered metal product production as a subtending of empire, which in the century, of course, following Olaus's death, would make Sweden, as it is today, the largest metal sourcer in Europe. But in the far north, unlike, say, in Potosi, what was taken from the underground was largely base rather than precious, iron versus silver. This was low stuff in Sweden, not currency, that formed the tools and weapons animating so many of Olaus's um, northern vignettes. And Olaus's particular fascination with northern cold is not unrelated. As I've tried to show elsewhere, the optical experience of a cave or mine, of course, offers a different relation to sight, which is counterintuitively proximate to the idea of cold weather. Perhaps the most beautiful passage from the entire book I'm talking today, the Historia, which is isolated first by the professor Barbara Sulham, is Olaus's writing on low temperature. The section defends cold as a maker of unknown forms, which alters the senses, primarily sight. Olaus lists this in a very, very strange way, almost like a 20th century conceptual artwork. It's quite amazing, it's not prose. As he writes, quote, Cold burns the eyes of animals and stiffens their hairs. Cold causes the pelts of all animals to be thicker and handsomer. Cold allows fish to be kept fresh for five to six months without salt. Cold causes copper, glass, and earthenware vessels to break. Cold allow games and most delightful shows to be held in the ice. Cold opens up pathless territories to travelers and hunters. Cold makes the skin peel off one's lips. 
fingers and nostrils if they touch iron. Cold causes inns to be set up, markets to be held, and wars to take place on frozen waters. Cold does not permit African Negroes taken in war or arriving in some old way to live for very long. Cold causes coughs, cold, and similar ailments. Now, this remarkable and you know, unsubtly racist litany posits cold as an asset and a cause, as a liberatory presence and a danger, which is, again, below northern framings of representation. Cold is a ruler. Its subjects are forced down. The Scandic winter is a kind of subjugated state. The cold is a kind of governor. And Elias goes on. This is the last large quote I'll give you. The huge power which the frost or cold possesses in the north, as if it were its own native region, can be demonstrated in many ways. Though the sense of feeling rather than by authority, since I was born and lived subject to this, even at a latitude of 86 degrees, I think that I am capable of proving this. Oleus writes that cold dictates, and the verb he uses in parat, the laws of nature. It's a kind of tyrant. Cold alerts bodies, both human and animal, to alternative conditions of existence. This cold is an exoticism, but an exoticism which, like snow, buries rather than reveals. Now, this submergence is a piece with Elias' attention to northern witchcraft and paganism, which he admits is legendarily pernicious in the treacherous haunts, as he writes, of Arctic caves frequented by robbers. Note, among the Bothian people of the north, he writes, wizards and magicians are found everywhere, as if it was their particular home. Demons, with unspeakable derision and extreme shapes, express their encouragement to people who live in these parts. Now, note again this interest in false appearances, a kind of ontology of suspicion. Now, this trickles throughout the book. Lapland enchanters and Burmian warlocks are presented, warlock, represented as shape-shifting menaces. Secret in here is a very specific anxiety about those northern beings lying below the expected world of sense. Now, Oleus is, of course, no Freud, but he frequently speaks of this cold magic as a kind of subconscious state. Hell itself, the ultimate underworld, is even audaciously northern, as he writes, quote, Iceland is an island to be praised for the extraordinary miracles in it, for there's a rock and promontory in it that boils like Mount Etna with perpetual fires, and there it is supposed that the place of hell is, like purgatory, to purge foul souls. So is this damnation or praise? Much of the secondary scholarship on the book tends to frame it as an encyclopedia of wonders or a bluntly nationalistic account of a neglected Renaissance geography. But what might Elias offer us more generally about theories of early modern landscape, icy or not, about understandings of art and culture rooted loosely in a bias towards, say, a kind of horizontal view of space? Now, we know that the book was read widely. Now, metaphorics of caves and holds, of course, underlie most of Western metaphysics, both before and after Elias. Think of Plato's Philalio, the cave, Lots from Genesis, where he hides with his daughter, Nietzsche's Höhle, or Kristeva's even sensory cavern. Undergrounds here in these sources are important places, but also liminal places between seen and unseen, between illusion and reality. The person most obsessed with undergrounds, of course, was Mark, who famously upheld the equity of the factory and the enslaved underworld, and may have actually uh, modeled capital from 1867 on Dante's Inferno. But the ancients known to Elias saw caves as meeting between the supernatural and the human, as with Plato, the place where representation was born. Virgil's Aeneas, known to Elias, engages the Greek notion of the katabasis, a descent to the underground that brings knowledge under duress. We can just look at newer etymologies around the, under, the, the idea of understand, which carry this whole very idea of going underneath to know. And in much scholarship around Elias's moment is indeed Dante, here shown his Inferno version by Italian art, artist Picaccio, uh, about, um, uh, Brunelli, 
which greets Virgil and the pilgrims in front of Lake Sunt, that informs scholarly graspings of earth and art. This is understandable, particularly in Dutch, English, and Italian contexts. The idea of landscape, again, a Dutch word, in word and image, emerged in a moment of map-like surveying, of perspectival brightness, of mobility, discovery, and empire. But the far north of Europe is not so easily about movement. Property, as an idea, is of course braided deep within the history of landschap, the Dutch word, as a word, and with it a certain aerial conception of space. But this is a different idea of space, as we see in Olaus. Yet even if we presume, as did Olaus, that landscape might be something more than surface, that landscape can be a habitat, can be an ideology, can be matter, can be an, even a mode, even if we attend to its dark side, lingering today in much scholarship on the humanities of the cold, still seems the assumption of the Earth's importance laying in its sunny, visible surface, that zone between ground and sky. We can think of the pastoral mode's central, pungent image, the immobile shepherd watching his flock across a field. The far north kind of diffuses all of this. Thus, in the short part of what remains in this paper, I want to return to some more general suggestions about what attention to underworlds, I see and beyond, may offer for thinkings of landscape. Olaus, I want to posit, offers off an inroad. In our centuries, the salvaging of landscape as a way of thinking about art and practice, cold or not, is basically based upon its modernist dismissal as retardaire, bourgeois, or worse, symbolically oppressive. It's relied upon a detachment from the idea of landscape as a picture, a view. Now, already in Olaus' century, the notion of Renaissance nature, not as image, but as creator, as agent, was writ. And Olaus is very, very prescient in um, his stunning discussion of what of all things we can speak about, snowflakes, as he illustrates in this woodcut of an icy window pane. It's quite remarkable. What a multiplicity of wonderful shapes and figures in snow can be found and examined everywhere, he writes, principally in the lands of the north. The farther one goes towards the Arctic pole, the more the falling snow seems to vary. It seems more a matter for amazement than inquiry why and how so many shapes and forms which elude the skill of any artist you may choose to name are suddenly stamped upon such soft, tiny objects, end quote. The cold here, as it were, as author. Even before, this creative icy earth was not always a space. It was an art of what comes down. In early modern Europe, Olaus' Rome then, as well as his native Sweden, the subterranean emerged as a place where resources, which is an 18th century word from the French resource, bore new valences of surfeit and lack. Mines, of course, remained sites of technological change and great social change in the 16th century, as truly global metal markets opened and Calvin's teachings offered icy condemnations of greed for wealth. In Germany, of course, mines were some of the earliest sites of organized labor actions with workers downing tools. And we've seen how Olaus was aware of this. And in the book, he warns of the dangers of precious metals and avarice. But geologists and artists in Olaus' ambit began to relativize the interior of the earth as more than just an extensive of its extension of its placid surface. As much as a load for extractivist enterprise, the underground suggested an alternative, potentially violent realm of pressures and forces which were unknown to the ancients or in scripture. A realm of, as one naturalist would put it, sin secrets of earthquakes, volcanoes, and fossils. Such a poetics pressured theories of Renaissance art creation focused only on the land, only in the land as a surface place. A burgeoning humanist lexicon, rooted in gestures and humanists' language's own exclamation, struggled with these new findings. They did not convolute smoothly into the classical realm of an underground as a realm of humanist roots and bones. All this is to say, the subterranean 
throughout Olaus' 16th century became less a site of pure negation. It was not just a hell to the sky's heaven. But there was a dialectic here. Landscape had always been a downward phenomenon. It had been, since Eden, a site of fall. What was historically specific about the subterranean imagine of Olaus' moment was an economic capital's transformation of Earth as a politics and an epistemology. That is, during this moment, humans no longer cohabited with the underground, but began to control it. And as much as the question of labor, what was changed here was also about the idea of matter as well. What is peat? What is soil? What is stone? And all of this wrought a particular attention and requestioning of the idea of the earth as space, one which, importantly, resonates with our contemporary 2024 awareness of the planet as a damaged, finite site. Olaus sides with the German writer Agricola when he argued against the idea that mining for metals is immoral. He claimed that the interior earth was like the sea. It is enclosed and hidden from sight, just like fishes. And there was also an element of time. Far later, a reader of Olaus, Thomas Burnett, presumed the Earth's interior to be blind, but also cold, whereas the surface was new. How like a ruin it lies gaping and torn in parts of it, the hollow and broken posture of things underground, all those caves and holes, all those blind recesses that are otherwise, otherwise so unaccountable, but say they are ruin. Now, the idea of an Earth itself as ruin creatively defamiliarizes the image of the Renaissance as the place where nature and culture diverge. Looking to the same century, we can even imagine how uh, the dead father in Shakespeare's Hamlet, which we know Shakespeare read Olaus, does some from under the ground. In Hamlet 1.5, Olaus, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, father, the father addresses uh, Hamlet, of course, from under the ground. It's in the first act. The first folio's words are, Ghost cries under the stage. All that is to say is that Olaus ultimately does not see the far north as directionally down, but a place resistant to clean divisions of interior and exterior, geologically as well as ontologically. His works, his book, of course, wants Sweden to seem attractive to Mediterranean readers. But even as a kind of Arctic Pliny, Olaus remains unsteadily vested in the power of his own ekphrasis. Speaking to a learned public conscious of Protestantism's confessional divorce from the Pope, Olaus' text is also colored by a post-Tridentine anxiety about images, about art's capacity to both illume and obscure history. The woodcuts do not explain Olaus' descriptions, but often seem to submerge them. Throughout the Historia, the exiled bishop can be seen struggling with his own prose's insufficiency. It's literal and figurative exile. It mirrors his from its subject matter. Now, in our own day, the vertical turn in cultural studies has critiqued the ways in which romantic ideations of space relied upon surface. Figurative and literal horizontality, exemplified by the Renaissance convention of linear perspective, has nourished modes of seeing the dissociated ground with something to look across rather than down. In our own thinking, flat thinking, as in our own decades, flat thinking, in much as time as its place, abets projects of surveillance and militaristic expansion by state and corporate actors alike. And such base matter, ground is what art historians work against. But of course, across the humanities, generations of theorizations of interpretation, of course, rely on excavations of underlying truths, of digging into texts. The very associations of depth and profundity comes from the Bible. Corinthians speaks of the deep things of God. The metaphor actually gained specific currency in a Laius century, and it was cherished by later avant-garde. This has specific relations to the far north. Lest we forget now how, again, Freud's own notion of the Unbevista relied upon that most arctic image of all, the iceberg. Now, Northern art history grimly has a very sinister history of looking down as an interpretive tact. There's Max Nordhaus and Tartung, a long screed against submerged people and social strata. The latter seized upon Peter Bruegel's wheel of estrangement regarding his image of the Flemish peasant, uh, peasantry, often in cold. 
Today, such a view with its downcast eyes, apart from its frightening period politics, banks on an anti-socialism, a social coldness and distance from the downward, a view from above. Since for many of these nationalist, cultural apologists of the then and now, soil, the base, is always a vital image, but it is a base which must always be ridden above, a kitschy rising up, a triumph of the will. To close, we can think of the way that Oleus lingers on today. There is the remarkable Finnish Swedish, Finnish Swedish TV mystery White Wall, which premiered in 2020. The show revolves about a forlorn industrial town in the Arctic sited over an exhausted salt mine, now repurposed as a nuclear waste depository. We know the filming was done actually at 700 meters below ground, about a half mile beneath the surface of the earth. In the show, an underground explosion occurs and kills three people, and a mysterious white wall is exposed on the site of the former mine, the origins and makeup of which are cryptic. Testing reveals the wall is 96% crypt, uh, carbon and 4% completely unknown material. It is possibly extraterrestrial. But the show offers no clear explanation. Strange things begin to occur at the mine and on the surface, and the show leaves us unsure as to whether this underground presence is menacing, welcoming, both or neither. Oleus is not far off. Now, White Wall summons current fears about the collision of neoliberal economics, economics with local identity, colonial aspirations, and environmental threat. In the show, the storage project will aid the resources of the struggling Arctic town, while the supernatural quality of the capsule alights upon the idea that certain grounds are indeed perhaps left undisturbed. The imagined prosperity promised by the site is itself a species of magic. But in a way, Olaus would have recognized a kind of paganism, a way of exerting power over other people while concealing human perception. Even Olaus had pointed out that metal objects specifically were believed to possess um, uh, healing powers for diseases. For minds, as Olaus himself put it, are themselves about limits, subterranean limits as to what can be viewed, understood, and known. We can close today, perhaps, as Olaus did, with a turn away from TV and a turn away from text to observations about the physical environment. We know that behavioral psychologists have studied physiognomic shocks that take place in underground dwellings. And this is the last quote. This is, from an, this is from a biologist. Quote, most obvious to anyone who has ever entered a natural cave, the lack of light results in the absence of any visual information. This not only concerns the loss of visual orientation, but also kinds of communication. The light entrained circadian seasons, timekeeping mechanisms that coordinate the physical and behavioral activities with season and daily rhythms are out of control in deep subterranean habitats, end quote. For indeed, it might be the question of control that haunts early modern anxieties about the underground's demotivation of sight, but with it, the possibility to make history, icy or not. In the end, the subterranean offers a mode pressuring traditional environmental critiques, cherishing visibility and spectacle. Since we now, all of us, grapple with a climate reality where up and down, like nature and human, are no longer distinct. Underground ecological change now threatens cities actually physically worldwide, San Diego included. For in the end, perhaps the most frightening or possibly emancipating possibility, which is latent in Olaus, is that the icy subterranean, Arctic or not, might be surprisingly undifferent from those bewildering worlds of our surface. Thank you. <laughs>